All right, can everyone hear me all right? So uh, as Karen said, I'm Annie. My name is Annie Coriel, and I'm here with my big American accent. Um, thank you so much for flying me in from New York. I'm very excited to be here. So today I am going to be talking about Cowbird. If any of you want to um, tweet your compliments or criticisms, um, you can add uh, hashtag Cowbird or at Cowbird if you want to make sure that it goes out to, to our followers online. So without further ado, I'll get started. Let's see if I can. So uh, the title of my talk today is Humanizing the Web. And uh, I think that this is something that we all, as digital storytellers and fans of digital storytelling, uh, struggle with. So I'm going to be uh, speaking from my own personal perspective about humanizing the web and what is entailed in that effort. Uh, I was a news reporter before I started on at Cowbird last December. Uh, I had been working as a uh, crime and courts reporter in New York City for five years. So most of what I did looked at um, news of the police tape variety, things that you probably wouldn't want to do on an, on an average Sunday. Uh, sometimes, though, I got to do features like this one, which is about morticians. And uh, usually I ended up discovering communities in New York City only when something really bad happened in those communities. I sort of got to know the underbelly of a very interesting, very diverse city, but unfortunately, these stories only came to the surface when something really terrible happened. Uh, so, actually, I did really enjoy this work. I, I found that I discovered incredible stories, and I got to see people when everything else had been stripped away. And they would share, they would open their hearts to me and share very personal details. However, what I found was that my experience on the street and in these people's homes was not translating was not making it out into the world. There was very little ripple effect. Even though I was reporting for the New York Times, uh, these stories had a lifespan of one, maybe two days if it was a really big story. So the question for me became not the traditional question that we asked our, ourselves as journalists, how do you find the story? It became how do we give these stories a life online when there is so much competing for readers' attention? So this question took me back to uh, the city where I was born, which is Bogota, Colombia, in the Andes here. And I went back. I went back to Bogota uh, specifically to report the story of uh, my father's kidnapping. Um, more, a little more than 10 years ago when I was in university, uh, my father was kidnapped on his way home from work. That was something that was very common at the time. It was happening up to eight times a day. My father was driving at the, and, and was sort of carjacked at this very spot on the road uh, by the FARC, which is a leftist guerrilla. And he was taken into the jungle where he was kept for uh, close to nine months. Um, most of the time, he was kept completely alone. Over the course of his kidnapping, we received one proof of life, uh, one photograph uh, letting us know that he was alive. Uh, the next image that you're going to see is that photograph, and you'll hear my father speaking. Or you won't. <laughs> it looks like we're having some. Oh, let's see. Maybe it'll kick in now. When I, w I was by myself between November that I was kidnapped until May 26, I could talk to the guards very little. They're not supposed to talk to you. But then at night, then you rewind your whole, your whole life. And what was that? That was scary because you start judging yourself, mostly what comes to mind is what you think you did wrong. Wrong decisions that could have made a difference in your life. 
but it's being alone with all those uh, ghosts. So I, I decided to tell my father's story and the story of other people who had been kidnapped in Colombia. Um, my father was held in a jungle very much like this one, um, very dramatic landscape. He was marched uh, between 38 places and handed from one unit of the guerrilla to the next. Uh, I reported this story for This American Life, um, an American radio program, and uh, what happened in this case was absolutely surprising to me. Uh, unlike all the reporting I had done in the past, this story managed to resonate with people around the world. The response was completely overwhelming. I got emails and Facebook messages and people asking how they could help. Partly that's because, of course, This American Life has uh, enormous reach around the world. But there was something else about this story that had clearly managed to pierce through the din of the internet. And I started thinking about what the qualities were in this kind of storytelling that differentiated it from our average news coverage of tragic events, sometimes much more tragic than what happened to my father. And I started thinking also about how we have, um, most of us now, have all the tool, have all the raw material that we need to tell these sorts of stories. We can usually record audio, even with our iPhones. People have good digital cameras. We can upload it onto our computers and create a story within days, if not hours. So here we have the raw material, and we have the internet where you can disseminate stories to thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. So I began to think, really, what's standing in our way? And as I was thinking about this, I approached um, a good friend of mine, Jonathan Harris, who's an artist and programmer, and we began talking about this. Uh, he had been developing a storytelling tool, um, a very simple platform that would put in the hands of ordinary people with ne without necessarily much journalistic training the, sorts, the sort of uh, power to reach a tremendous number of people. Um, so as we, as we started talking about working together, we began to talk about what the qualities of storytelling were that made it different from traditional journalism and which we thought were necessary to make these stories reach people. Um, how were these stories different from what you were getting from other outlets? One was um, in the face of, uh, you know, so-called um, objectivity, but not just objectivity, um, the sense of an overwhelming amount of information delivered to us by the mainstream media. Uh, personal experience has a different sort of uh, authority and a different sort of power to reach people. Um, and the next thing is, is depth. What we, had, we talked about and which he had noticed was that uh, with speed on the internet and with this 24-hour news cycle, there was a great deal of compression. So big news stories were getting compressed down to the length of 140 characters, of the length of a tweet. And, uh, you know, information was approaching a sort of terminal velocity. And the question was, what, what comes after that? Do we become even faster or do we sort of reel back? and become more reflective and bring depth to our stories. The third thing that we noticed that was very powerful about storytelling, about digital, the best digital storytelling, was an element of vulnerability. And I think that's something you don't hear people talk about a lot, but on the internet there is a, a, a big movement towards self-promotion. Um, people are becoming their own brands. They have their own website, they have their own Facebook profile, and even to their friends, they're promoting themselves. Look at my beautiful girlfriend, look at my great vacation. And this is actually a sort of dehumanizing force. It's very hard for us to see each other as people if we're always trying to make ourselves look good. 
So one force that can kind of counteract that is opening up and um, showing where the spots in which we're vulnerable, because usually those are, those are spots that everyone can identify with, much more than the spots in which we, we show off. The, the, the fourth element is surprise. So if we go through those elements, what are, about digital storytelling? It's personal experience, depth, vulnerability, and surprise. These are four things that can create something truly lasting, something that can go beyond the onslaught, the overwhelming feed of tweets and Facebook posts that we have every day. So with those things in mind, um, we launched um, Cowbird last fall, sort of here's a recap of, of sort of why these, we felt these things were necessary. And uh, this is Cowbird. So what we decided to do was to bring this out to give people the chance to really bring their own experiences um, online. Um, I don't know how many of you have looked at Cowbird. I can do a demo to show you sort of how it works. So, are we online? Here we go, this is Cowbird. Um, every, every day we have a story of the day. Today it is, um, let's take a look. It is a story about uh, Afghanistan, about a reporter in Afghanistan who ran toward a bomb while everyone else was running away. And he and his um, colleagues are sort of uh, working on uh, an effort to make sure that the story of Afghanistan stays in the news. So um, this is the typical format of a Cowbird story. You have the, the image, the text, and then below you get to see a little bit more about the story. You have this metadata. So here are the tags, um, the people who have loved this story, other stories set in Kabul, and a little bit about the the, the author, so he's tagged it with being human, bombing Afghanistan, Barack Obama, various uh, tags that can take you into other ways to explore the content on Cowbird. So these are all our stories from Afghanistan or related to Afghanistan. This is an Afghan, um, Afghani man who participated in Occupy Wall Street. Um, so this should give you an idea of kind of the way that you can um, land on Cowbird and then sort of find your, yourself jumping from one thing to the next and discovering new material, which brings us back to the idea of uh, surprise. So um, here are the daily stories. You can look at recommended, um, most loved, most viewed, um, and people. Uh, but another way that we, we've organized the information and we've brought people um, or we've brought stories together is here with uh, let's see, with our sagas. So our sagas are calls for stories. And we started with Occupy Wall Street. That was sort of the impetus behind launching something like Cowbird. Um, we gathered you know, 608 stories from around the world about the Occupy movement. Um, our next and most popular saga to date was First Loves. And our most recent was Working, um, which was sort of in the tradition of Studs Terkel. So it was uh, stories about how people work and, and why they do what they do. Um, but uh, First Loves was by far <laughs> the most popular. And um, here's some, this is a, a Welsh woman named Annie Atkins. Um, she tells a story about a heartbreak. I'll let you look at that on your own time. Here's a woman who, uh, her proposal was painted on her back while she was um, lying on the ground. So uh, these are just various ways to uh, give you a sense of the kind of diversity of content. Um, you'll have a story of Afghanistan and then you'll have a story of a proposal. So they're not the typical barriers that stand between um, stories. Uh, and here's one that brings both themes together. This is. Uh, a storyteller, uh, Aaron Huey, talented photojournalist. He got married on top of this tank. 
um, in Can I think in Kandahar, and he thanks the Taliban for making him realize what was truly important and proposing to his now wife. So um, this should give you an idea of uh, what, what Calvert is all about. And um, I'll give you sort of a better idea, hopefully. Um, let's see. So this is just a little recap of what we were going through in case we didn't have a strong enough connection. Um, here is a story uh, that will show you another aspect that I think is really um, important to the kind of uh, novelty <laughs> of this platform, which is that we not only have we, we don't only have um, images and text. There's also the um, capacity okay, so to I'm add here. audio. Oh. Okay, so I'm in uh, I'm in a city called Ahmedabad, which is in Gujarat in western India. And I'm walking around the streets. It's like a really intense, dense downtown city, and it's Sunday. Um, and in India, as you know, as a white man, people are always yelling out to you, what is your name? What is your name? And so at the beginning, it's really exciting. But after a little while, I have no more patience anymore to hear people asking me what my name is. And so I don't start the conversation. And all of a sudden, someone yells out to me, how many fingers do you have? <laughs> and to me, this is the best pickup line I've ever heard. <laughs> and so I'm intrigued. And I go over, and I say, well, I have. 10 fingers, I have five fingers on this hand, five fingers on this hand. And this guy says to me, I have 13 fingers, I have seven fingers on this hand and six fingers on this hand. And I look at his hands and sure enough, he's got 13 fingers. And so, so what do you do when I'm bad? So I grab his hand and I start to shake his hand. I say, wow, it's a gift from the gods, you know? <laughs> and he's smiling, he's laughing, and he takes a couple pictures of me and he says, how many toes do you have? And by this point, I'm blown away. I say, I have and he says, I have six toes on this foot, and I have six toes on that foot. He says, you can count to 20, but I can count to 25. <laughs> so I think this is a great example of what a simple story platform, a simple editor, can help you make work of this quality, really in your own bedroom. Um, I also think this is a great example of the, the, the four things that I listed before. This is a personal experience. It is slower, so there's a bit more depth. While you're listening to the voice, you sort of start looking at his face, counting his fingers. Uh, and there is a certain amount of vulnerability. You hear the voice. Um, there's, this is a very human interaction between two people. And of course, there's surprise, because a man with 13 fingers is surprising. Uh, here's the next story I think also accomplishes those those four goals, but it does it in a very different way I'm not going to play the whole thing because it's a bit longer, but um, I will I'll let you I'll give you a taste for it Look at her face You could not paint anything like this It is so silent at the time uh, where she was photographing herself doing almost everything and she came in after the rain snapped this photograph of her face and when I saw this picture I fell in love <laughs> I felt I fell in love with, with her I fell in love with this image I fell in love with the whole concept of everything that she represented as a person and I had never even met her in my life. We had become friends on Flickr, believe it or not, in 2005. I was heavily into Flickr, the concept of sharing photos and knowing someone through their photos was very new and exciting. And I took to it and took it very seriously and did not really form any, you know, artistic relationships in the same way I was forming one with Angelique, who I only knew by her tag name, Weird Rubik's Cube, 
which in and of itself is weird and uh, seductive somehow. But uh, she had displayed her art and I had seen her life in Normandy, you know, kept in touch, I was even, you know, sending her photographs of the girl that I was dating, saying, isn't she wonderful? Not knowing at the time that it broke her heart to hear that from me. Uh, what happened between Angelique and I is impossible to describe in a 10 megabyte mp3. But uh, looking at this photo, in particular, the hair ar around the ear and the hair across her eyes, the shape of her lips, her nose, those eyes, the eyebrows, the expression, vacant yet present, the softness of her skin, her neck, the whole thing is just... I mean, it is really just super. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> So you can listen to what happened between Scott and Angelique if you go online. But I think this is a, a wonderful story, and it reminds us that when you have multimedia storytelling, which is becoming sort of a dated word, but... Uh, when you do have more than one medium, uh, it's best if they work together. And a lot of the, the surprise can come from that. Uh, a photograph shouldn't just be tagged on there uh, as an illustration. Shouldn't, we shouldn't confine ourselves to the ways that newspapers have used photographs. There can be an interaction between the media, whether it's um, audio or text. And, and the image, and that can be very powerful. I think uh, filmmakers like Scott understand that uh, implicitly. Uh, I think that when we go about telling stories, we should remember that it's, it's an artificial division between the senses. Um, sight and hearing uh, are actually intimately intertwined, and if we can recreate that with our stories, the story will be all the more powerful. Uh, so the next story um, uh, is not as cheerful, but uh, I think it's a, it's, it's a great example as well. Turn on. Here's, here's the story of my first love. I don't usually tell it all at once because it's a really long story, but I will try to condense the 13 years down a little bit. This is a list of firsts that happened to me over that time in chronological order. First crush. First date, first time telling someone I like her, first unrequited like, first time persisting anyway, first kiss, first epistolary romance, first girlfriend, first love, first time buying a ring, first time asking someone to marry me, first time getting married, first time getting walked in on by a cleaning lady in the honeymoon suite while in various stages of undress. First time having sex. First apartment together. First vacation together. First time failing at Valentine's Day. First fight. First anniversary. Second time failing at Valentine's Day. First signs of trouble. First difficult conversation. First marriage counseling session. First time losing hope that things would ever get better. First time deciding to leave. First time breaking someone's heart. First separation. First divorce. So Whitney's story is a reminder that you do not necessarily need uh, a lot of time to tell a very powerful story. That's a minute and 30 seconds. So uh, depth doesn't have to be mean length. You can tell a very powerful story with a minimum not only of imagery, but also of, of text and audio. So um, I hope those are some good examples. This is a, kind of a recap of what I showed you online. What I'd also uh, like to sort of end on is that these um, stories, I think, 
it, as, as, as you well know here in Wales, I think stories are also intimately connected to, to place. So um, we have organized uh, stories by topic, but we also have stories organized by place, um, which is just a very good way to um, discover content, but also begin to understand uh, what you know is culturally important for people in different places, and to create a kind of exchange uh, between people in different places, a sort of sort of um, couch surfing <laughs> for storytellers. Uh, and so, as you can see, the UK is our second most popular um, destination, not destination, source of stories on uh, Cowbird. And uh, if you go on to Cowbird, you can actually search through some of the storytellers here locally. Um, and you can you know, see Wales up there in the corner. We have 17 people from Wales and 50 stories. Um, or you can go to the other places. And this can be an amazing way to not just uh, experience stories, but actually start connecting with the storytellers. Because if you noticed, when I was showing you the stories, there was a bar at the bottom. You can love a story. You can join a, a storyteller's audience. You can also dedicate stories to other people. And this happens more than you would imagine. People read a story. They're so moved that they go and tell another story related to the one that they saw, and they dedicate it to, to the storytellers. So what we hope to do in the future is uh, create a global network, a sort of semi-nomadic global network of storytellers who can also meet and um, share you know, a coffee or sit around a campfire and tell stories. So I'd encourage you to go on and, and whatever country you're from, see who else is there and what, what stories they're telling. Um, this is a story we have from Cardiff. Uh, actually, that's the Cardiff Castle, and this is a man who came to shoot photographs of the band, uh, a death punk band called The Damned, which some of you may remember. And he sort of recalls this day of shooting um, The Damned in Cardiff Castle, and how surprised tourists were when they turned around the corner and saw these sort of death vampires who uh, <laughs> slept in coffins at night. Uh, so again, you, you can discover the present of wherever you might be, but also layers of the past. Um, and uh, this is, this is the, the, the final two stories that I'm going to end on are um, among our most popular. Uh, this is from Leilani Holmes, who lives in London. And it's a story of um, a young man, clearly very disturbed, who started headbutting a double-decker bus in London and had to be restrained by the police officers. He, she, she says, what made him senselessly violent uh, toward a, a big red bus, I can only surmise. Police nearby ran to restrain him. And this is something that happened to her on her way home. It was sort of just a freak occurrence that she managed to capture with this incredible photograph. Um, this is one of our most popular stories and I think it's you know, a good example of the sort of participatory journalism that's possible with a good, solid platform. However, this right now is also a story from the UK, and it is our number one most loved story. It's been viewed almost 5,000 times and loved over 400 times. And it's a story in which a father apologizes to his son for not spending more time with him. And he sort of says, you know, extrapolates his own situation toward other people in the world and says, I want the world to shove productivity up its backside for once. I want parents to throw newspapers in the bin, switch off gizmos, and talk to each other, talk to their kids. And he promises his son that he's going to be more present and that he won't, you know, miss any more birthday parties. So the fact that this is our most loved story on Cowbird, which currently has close to 15,000 uh, members who have signed up, really goes, it reinforces this idea that what we really are hungry for is not super polished, overly edited professional stories, but something that is human. And uh, that brings us back to the topic of this talk, which is humanizing the web. Uh, I don't think that anyone can wave a magic wand and turn the, turn the web into uh, 
a humane, happy, positive utopia. I think that what has to happen is that you as digital storytellers and educators can reach people in your communities and help make the web something that isn't scary or off-putting, impersonal, overwhelming, threatening to these people, but something that can be theirs, uh, something that can be approachable, some, a place where they would want to put their most personal and precious stories. So humanizing the web, I think, has to happen uh, through each storyteller, not by some large, larger force that, that turns the, all the content in the web into something uh, beautiful. So uh, with that, I will end the talk. Um, and hopefully you'll see that the web is human and that it has been humanized and that this is a continual process that you can all be a part of. Um, I'm going to end with one uh, cute little story, which is uh, called Rainbow. Rainbow's Weddings and Battles. Rainbow. Rainbow. What's the sound you make when you see a rainbow? Thank you very much.